Hello, everyone. I'm Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell, and I represent the 13th District, which includes the neighborhood that we're going to talk about today, Rampart Village. Uh, but first, let me welcome everyone. We have an exciting uh, panel today to talk about some of the updates that are improving this community. Uh, let me wish everyone a safe, healthy autumn. Uh, we are now in our seventh month of the pandemic, so we're not out of the woods, not by a long shot. So I hope everyone's being careful. I hope everyone's masking, uh, taking all the precautions that protect not only you and your family, but others. Um, we're in this together. I've said this all along. Um, and we'll, we're pulling together as never before as a city and as a community. So this is uh, our 63rd council member in your corner, which started back in 2013 uh, out in the real world. when We would uh, go door to door. We've done this for as long as I've been in office now um, at seven years and three months. Well, a few months ago, we decided to go virtual with our monthly neighborhood walk council member in your corner. But we are still doing a lot of the activities that we would do in, in the real world at the time. We arrange for a bulky item and trash pickup. We do neighborhood cleanups. Uh, we paint out graffiti. So uh, as council member in your corner evolved over the recent years, they became a community event picking one Saturday of the month somewhere in a neighborhood in the 13th district. So Rampart Village, uh, it encompasses the corridors of Temple, Beverly, uh, Virgil, along Hoover. It's an area that is also shared with historic Filipino town, uh, at the Temple Beverly area, uh, parts of Echo Park, uh, but it's Rampart Village. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some of the improvements and uh, activities that are happening uh, right now. Uh, first of all, let me acknowledge a milestone that we reached today. Today, one year ago, uh, we enacted the plastic straw ban. Uh, so, uh, you know, with the environment being what it is, uh, plastic straws seems like a small component to improving the environment, but actually it plays an outsized role being a coastal city uh, in terms of the plastics that go into the Pacific Ocean. So we took action and you can only get a plastic straw upon request from a restaurant. And even when we introduced this initiative, restaurants began going to biodegradable or no straws at all. It's one easy uh, thing that people can do to help save our environment as uh, you do your takeout or your, your dining in safely distance at our restaurants. Um, so some updates, permanent supportive housing. Uh, homelessness and affordable housing uh, is among my top priorities in office, always has been from the first day back in 2013 in my first term. Homelessness is the humanitarian crisis of our time with over 41,000 people experiencing homelessness in our city. We are working to create more shelter and housing throughout the city and identify real solutions to address the root causes, including poverty, mental health issues, substance addiction issues, uh, and we owe it to our homeless neighbors uh, to get them the health and well-being that they need and on a path uh, to being healthy. Uh, here are some projects that recently opened or are coming online. Um, Path Metro Villas, the first Measure HHH project in the city, started welcoming residents back in August, and that is uh, in Rampart Village, uh, right there at uh, Madison off of Beverly. Along with that, there are 98 units of temporary bridge housing co-located on this incredibly beautiful campus. Uh, a lot of folks have a misunderstanding about Measure HHH. Uh, it's a $1.2 billion bond, and we seek to build 10,000 units of permanent supportive housing. We're well on our way with over 9,000 of those 10,000 units approved in the pipeline under construction, people moving in. Uh, and so we feel that within five or six years, we'll have the 10,000 units complete. We are on track, despite what you might have heard in the media, which is untrue. We're on track to get to those 10,000 units. Is it enough to house all of our homeless uh, population? Absolutely not. But this is one critical tool that voters approved back in 2016. And we are grateful for the city support 
uh, to, to, for homeless solutions. And this is definitely one of them. As you can see from the photos, the setting is beautiful. A main courtyard with an amphitheater and gardens, community rooms, uh, community kitchen for cooking classes, offices for the caseworkers, including mental health, who will help residents get on their feet. Residents like Albert, who is pictured in this last photo. Albert is a formerly homeless neighbor from the Beverly Union area who spent 12 years not far from his new home uh, living in a parkway in a tent. So now Albert is thriving in his permanent new home and this is what this effort is all about. I've championed this project from the start and my team assisted with the permits to keep the project on track. The construction of permanent supportive housing and affordable housing are absolute key to our homelessness crises and I'm committed to doing this important work along with providing other critical services to those living on the streets, our homeless neighbors. Uh, this is Enlightenment Plaza. In July, the City Council approved the necessary entitlements to allow Enlightenment Plaza to move forward. This is very nearby the Path Metro Villas that we just showed you. Located in, Amp in Rampart Village near Vermont Avenue in Beverly, this multi-phase project will include 454 permanent supportive housing units and social services for the formerly people experiencing homelessness and low-income families. Uh, and we are hopeful to be getting site control very soon and with a goal of temporarily, once we get site control, putting in uh, a uh, place for people who are living in their vehicles. Uh, so that's something else that will be a temporary use, also helping uh, in this crisis. Um, this is exciting too. Earlier this month, Cruz also broke ground on the development of search to involve Filipino Americans which is known as SEPA, their offices uh, into 63 units of permanent supportive housing, again, for people experiencing homelessness. This project called Hi-Fi Collective is located at Dillon and Temple and will also include 6,100 square foot office space for SEPA, as well as a multi-purpose space and professional grade kitchen. The project will also include a small business center named in honor of John Eric Swing, who we lost back in late June to COVID, a beloved community leader and former executive director of SEPA. I can think of no better way to honor John's legacy than by bringing this project to fruition. Now we have the Rampart Mint. This is another permanent supportive housing project that is set to welcome new residents in the coming weeks. Stay tuned because we're gonna get a full update on the progress of the Mint in just a moment. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit, talk about mo mobility and uh, pedestrian safety. Pedestrian safety is my number one transit priority as council member. So we've done lots of streetscape improvements, uh, lots of improvements near our schools, uh, because I want to make sure that people can feel safe navigating their own neighborhood by foot or visiting destination neighborhoods. Uh, in, in 2019, my office completed the Beverly Boulevard Transportation Enhancement Project. That's two and a half miles of pedestrian improvements between Vermont and Beaudry Avenues that help to create a walkable, pedestrian-friendly urban community, which will contribute to the overall goal of promoting the use of our transit system while reducing reliance on automobiles. And the neighborhood looks better in the process. This $1.37 million project uh, includes 17 new ADA compliant curb ramps, and that's the American with Disabilities Act, five reconstructed compliant driveways, three new curb extensions, again, making it safer for pedestrians to navigate, two median refuge islands, one located at Lafayette Park Street, surfaced with cobblestone, which can be seen in the previous photo, and one located at Occidental Street with enhanced landscaping and irrigation. Again, beautifying the neighborhood while making it safer. Uh, we also have 19 new street trees. The, the urban heat island effect is really something. Today's October 1st, it's 100 degrees in Los Angeles. We've got to plant more trees, we've got to keep them alive, and we need to increase our urban forest every chance we get. Um, four new bike racks this project includes and the Continental Crosswalks, the big, wide ladder 
uh, crosswalks that make it very visible for, for motorists to slow down, provide that visual cue to drive more carefully because pedestrians are in the area. Our partner agencies include Council District 1, Mr. Cedillo's office, the Los Angeles uh, Department of Transportation, and the Department of Water and, and Power. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the CLEAN team. Now the CLEAN team participates at every council member in your corner, but they also go out five days a week in the district somewhere doing cleanups, light tree trimming, removing garbage and trash, and removing blocked sidewalks and even blocked parking lanes of traffic. They do nearly 900 large and small projects a year throughout the 13th district, and I can't even imagine what the district would look like without my clean team. So I'm very, very proud. Uh, we've, we've sponsored the clean team since July of 2013, and we're gonna keep that going. Um, the north side of Temple Street between Michelle Terena and Temple Overpass, it's the bridge over Silver Lake Boulevard, was uh, maintained and cleaned. Uh, the crew trimmed trees, removed weeds, cleared debris. I just wanna thank them for their continued collaboration. Uh, we always post the before and after on my social media channels. I'm very proud of that because once we started doing that in 2013, my colleagues started following. So if we can set good trends um, or follow good trends, then um, I'm all for it. Uh, we're going to take some questions as a reminder toward the end of the program, so uh, uh, stay with me here. Uh, and then if we can't get to all the answers, because we have a limited time here, then we'll certainly answer them online, the ones that we can't get to right now. Now, I mentioned I have a very uh, important panel of partners today to talk about their work in the neighborhood. Our first uh, is going to be uh, Ye Cornell from the Filipino American Service Group, known as FASG. We have Captain Al Lopez, Los Angeles Police Department Rampart Division, and uh, his liaison for this community, Rob Solario, an amazing senior lead officer. Uh, we also have Lauren Ballard of the Los Angeles Transportation Department and Sam Borelli of the West Hollywood Community Housing Corporation uh, to give some updates on projects that are going to be important to everyone who's listening. Also joining from my staff is Marisol Rodriguez, my district director, and Juan Fregoso, my Rampart Village Field Deputy. So Mar Marisol and Juan, uh, I'd like to start with you to tell viewers about your respective roles in the office and how residents can reach you. So Marisol, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you, Council Member. Uh, I am Marisol Rodriguez and I am District Director uh, for the Council Member in CD13. And I oversee field operations and supervise uh, the field team. Our district office is located in Echo Park, right in the heart of Echo Park on Sunset Boulevard. And while we are not currently open for walk-in visitors, uh, constituents are welcomed to reach us via phone at 213-207-3015, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to be connected with the appropriate staff member. Uh, currently, uh, as I said, we're not accepting uh, walk-ins, but we are scheduling one-on-one -on -one constituent calls and also video chats uh, by appointment. Um, for the community of Rampart, our field deputy representative is Juan Fragoso, and I will turn it over to him to talk about uh, some of the services that we provide here in the field. Hi, thank you, Marisol. Um, again, my name is Juan Fragoso, and I, I oversee a, a few neighborhoods here in the district for the council member, um, Echo Park, Westlake, um, historic Filipino town, and as he mentioned, here in Rampart Village. Um, and day to day, we're working on handling a lot of the quality of life um, issues here here in our neighborhoods and, and working with the various city departments to try and resolve um, a lot of your constituent issues. Um, if you need or have any questions pertaining kind of to what's going on in your community, um, we're always a good um, place to start, your, your first point of contact, and you can reach out to our district office. Um, at the time, somebody saw that said, we, we always have someone that's answering the calls and my colleague Steve can always forward them directly to me and you can also send me an email. Um, you can find all my information um, at cd13.com and um, we'll be here to help. Thank you, Marisol and Juan. Uh, you know, they say that an elected official is only as good as his or her staff. And let me just tell you, if I look good at all, it's because of people like Marisol and Juan. So I wanna thank my entire team for your incredible work. Um, you believe in our mission 
and that fortifies me every day. So thank you. Um, next, we're going to have Ye Coronel from FOSG, the executive director. We've partnered with FOSG for years. It's one of my highly valued relationships. So I'm so glad, Ye, that you were able to join us today. Please tell us a little bit about FOSG. Yes. Thank you so much, Mitch, and thank you for inviting me today. Yes, FOSG is located in the heart of historic Philippine town. We're on um, Parkview Street in between Council and Beverly. And um, we're a nonprofit organization established in 1981. And this month is actually our birthday month. We're turning 40. So yeah, we're getting to that stage. Um, yes. Do we have the slides? To show no okay so FASG's mission basically is to promote um the cultural social and economic advancement of individuals in the community and we try to do this by providing as much as possible the highest quality service that we can provide to the community while we are geared to the filipino america to filipino americans and filipinos we serve everyone and we try to help everyone that comes through our doors um, so during the pandemic, when this started, we were worried because most of our programs were, were done um, online. I mean, were done in person. So we quickly had to adapt to do everything online. And so we continue our mental health services and our naturalization program to on, through online um, webinars and stuff. And um, our arts incubation program is uh, temporarily uh, halted, except for an artist's art, uh, Artists in Residence program. Our culinary arts program is also halted because of social distancing, but our housing assistance program continues. So our mental health program consists of various um, activities. We have a human trafficking program that works with the PWC, that's the Filipino Worker Center, and we help to work with survivors of labor trafficking and their lingering trauma and their negative emotions. Um, as a result of the pandemic, we all we got to start our Healthy Perspectives program. And while this was started to try and address the loneliness and boredom that are being ex experienced by the seniors, the active seniors who are used to being out and are suddenly homebound, um, this has now become quite an intergenerational program. We have um, youth and uh, people of all ages attending these programs. So we provide different activities, and this happens weekly, Thursdays at 2 p.m. Um, and, and it can be uh, classes on health, classes on cooking, um, uh, education on flower arrangement, the succulents arrangement. Last week, we had the FBI come in and talk about um, crime and the different um, ways on how to deal with them. And then we have our physical therapy and holistic, holistic programs. These are free services that are provided um, and they're one-on-one -on -one services with holistic healers. And um, we will connect you, just give us a call and we will connect you and make sure that you get the help that you need. Sometimes um, talk therapy may be, may not, um, some people may not respond that well to talk therapy. And so we try all sorts of things. So we partner with, with several holistic healers and these are activities that they can do even at home to try and relieve stress, promote relaxation, and just try to make everything whole. Now the physical therapy addresses the physical um, symptoms of mental health problems. You know, because sometimes when you're feeling bad mentally, then um, it translates into physical stuff like you get headaches you, in there, those are tension headaches, and um, just a lot of things can happen. So these are free, so feel free to call us if you want to avail of these services, and even if you just want to try them. Then um, also as a result of the pandemic, we had a Balik Bahay project, and Balik Bahay means return to home. And since we're all required, we were all required to stay at home, you know, we tried to help out by providing care packages to the people most in need, the ones who lost their job, the seniors that were not reached by, um, by, by government services or other services. And we also provided care packages to restaurant workers, which we could consider as essential workers. 
because a lot of people were concentrating on the medical uh, workers, but we felt that the, the restaurant workers also needed to needed um, attention because they also were providing vital services to people by provide, providing continuing to, to provide food. So we also established as part of that program, a survey to identify more of how people react to COVID-19. We, we distributed pamphlets and we created eight webinars, the last of which is happening this weekend. Um, so, and then the other thing since September is um, emergency preparedness month, right? So we also had an emergency preparedness, awareness, and education. And this was conducted with, in partnership with Listos California and also with Governor Gavin Newsom. So um, we are still conducting that program and we will probably just keep doing that until the end of the year. We want to make sure that people are ready in the event of the disaster. And we, in light of the, uh, not just the pandemic, but the recent fires and the earthquakes that happened, we think that that's very important. So a lot of information is available on emergency preparedness at getready.fastg.org. And then um, our last mental health program is a virtual happy hour. So we do that every Friday at 6 p.m. And again, you know, I mean, one of the things that happened with the pandemic is a lack of socialization. So we provide a venue so that people can continue to, to socialize. And this is something that's purely fun. We don't touch on work. We don't touch on, on our programs. We don't touch on everything, but we are mindful of how people react. Um, we continue our naturalization program, as I said, and through this program, we help immigrants become citizens, US citizens, and we help with their application process. We try to give them tips and help in that way. So our arts incubator program, as I said, um, we cannot continue, but through that program, aside from the artist in residence program, where we house some artists that are very much in need, we also have a permanent gallery that um, we can still show on an appointment basis. We have we try to do exhibits at least two to four times a year. So um, yeah, and and uh, art workshops and instruction. We have portraiture, and then we have the culinary arts program where we teach people how to cook. And to contact us, please. We're in ba we're at the Fasci Bayanian Center again, located in on Parkview Street between Council and Beverly. And our email is admin at fastg.org. Our phone number is 213-908-5050. And you can also contact us through Facebook, Instagram, and through our website at www.fastg.org. So thank you so much, and I hope you are all staying safe. Just remember, everyone at FASCI, we are honored to serve and happy to help. Thank you. Yay, thank you so much for that presentation. Thanks for all you do. And you mentioned restaurant workers. One of our partner agency, agencies that we work with is No Us Without You, uh, and they help feed back-of-the-house restaurant workers. So that could be an, a, a, a partnership opportunity for us, Know Us Without You, and FOSS G coming up. So thank you so much. Uh, next, we have a, a, an amazing, dedicated community partner uh, working diligently with his entire team, the men and women of the LAPD Rampart Division, and that's Captain Al Lopez, and he's with, here with Rob Solario, who is our amazing senior lead officer for the area. So I'd like to turn it over to Captain Lopez to give an update uh, on public safety. Good morning, everybody. My name is Al Lopez. I'm the commanding officer here at Rampart Division. And before I get started, I want to thank Councilman O'Farrell for continuing his commitment to com uh, Councilman in Your Corner program, a, a instrumental program that is necessary to continue the outreach to our community members and the 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 le the avenue in which we can communicate with our community members. As I began uh, the presentation uh, and the status of Rampart. On behalf of the men and women who make up Rampart, the 300 uh, men, women, sworn, and civilian staff, we want to thank our community members for your continued engagement, your, comp your continued outreach, and more importantly, your support 
especially as we, we uh, venture into this year, complete this year of 2020. I think we all are looking forward, forward to 2021 uh, and, and what that brings us. Um, a, as I begin the presentation, I want, I want to talk about our city as, in, as, in a whole, as a whole. Currently, the city has an 8.8% reduction in part one crime. And that is year to date. And that is a very uh, uh, great number to look at. But even though we have a reduction, we do have some increases in some areas of crime. For instance, our homicide, we are at a plus 14% year to date. We have 228 uh, homicides year to date compared to 199 last year at this time. Um, and our GTAs, our grand theft auto crime, we're at a 34% increase in grand theft auto crime. That's uh, 15,401 compared to 11,436 uh, this time last year. Um, those are two areas that not only are, are plaguing the entire city, but plaguing Rampart as well. Um, so as we look at Rampart, you got to understand the size of Rampart. Rampart is only 5.54 square miles. We go from Sunset to the north to the Santa Monica Freeway to the south. We go from uh, Hoover and Normandy to the west and then the uh, Harbor Freeway to the east. Uh, we encompass 164,000 residents according to the 2010 census data. We know that population swells during the afternoon on a Wednesday and Thursday. And we know that this area is made up of six distinct communities, the West Lake, the Pico Union, the Echo Park, the Silver Lake, the East Hollywood, and the Filipino Town. Uh, just by naming those six communities, I could say Rampart is the most densely populated area within the city and the most diverse area within the city. As far as part one crime in Rampart, we are experiencing a 5.6 reduction in crime year to date. That's 217 fewer crimes uh, than we had in 2019, uh, 2020 compared to 2019. But we do have an increase in homicides. We have 17 homicides uh, compared to nine. That's an 89% increase. And, and we have a, a Central Bureau homicide investigative team that is working with the Rampart detectives to investigate every one of these homicides. Um, we also have, and I look at loss of life very seriously. So not only do I look at my homicides, I look at my vehicle fatalities very seriously. And currently we have a 75% increase in vehicle fatalities year to date. We have seven compared to four last year at this time. Our grand theft autos are also, we also have an increase in grand theft autos at 54% increase. That's 671 uh, grand theft autos compared to 434 last year at this time. That's 237 more grand theft autos. But I could tell you the men and women Rampart Division are, make, are phenomenal and they're making incredible arrests. We have made uh, 147 arrests for grand theft autos year to date. That's 107% increase compared to 71 last year. So, so your men and women are out there working. But let's look at um, our, our, our Rampart Village area. And, and as described by the council member, that area is north of Temple to Sunset from the 110 freeway to the east to uh, Hoover and, and Normandy to the west. Um, that area, we have a reduction in part one crime in that area of 16.9%. That's 665 compared to 764. That's 99, cent per, 99 fewer crimes that have occurred in that area. But we have two homicides that ha have occurred in that area. And we have had three fatals vehicle fatalities that have occurred in that area with two on Sunset in Douglas and one at Temple and Beverly. Uh, we have our aggravated assaults. We have 10 more aggravated assaults uh, that have occurred in that area uh, compared to last year at this time. It's 74 aggravated assaults compared to 64. And our GTAs, our grand theft auto crime is up as well in that area at 151 compared to 75. Um, so that is an increase of 50%. Um, so as, as you look at our overall crime, we are doing, we are utilizing a variety of, of tasks to try to combat this crime. We have developed our SARA projects, our neighborhood enforcement areas. 
one being Echo Park and one being uh, over on uh, Madison, where we are trying to infuse community engagement. We're utilizing all our avenues within Rampart Division, our specialized units, our patrol, our focused uh, enforcement in that area, our foot beats in that area, but we're trying to get the community to help us as well. Uh, we believe that by engaging the community and having outreach, we can help reduce the crime in that area. So our SARA projects and our neighborhood enforcement uh, uh, um, areas uh, can be impacted, can drive that crime down through community engagement. Uh, we also have had a bunch of community outreach that I want to talk about in, for the month of September. We had a Vision Zero commitment with Esperanza Elementary, although not in the Rampart Village area. We, op we made a safe passage for kids to go to school, but we have three other uh, areas that we're looking to partner with Vision Zero to help kids go to school. And two of those areas are within the Rampart Village area. We had a food distribution here at Rampart Station with our partners from AVL Distribution and Braddock Distribution, where we fed a thousand people on September 19th. Tremendous work. Now, we, as we move into October, we are looking at a national night out here at Rampart Station on October 6th, where we're partnering with our community partners, and we plan on feeding 2,000 people on a grab-and-go here on Loma Street next to our station. So if you can, spread the word, come to Rampart Station. We have our community partners, and we're going to be giving food away for our national night out. It's going to be different than before, but we feel we need a partner and help our community members. We also have a Faith and Blue uh, uh, event at Pico and Union Project at 1153 Valencia on October 9th, where we're going to do a community cleanup and another food giveaway. And then on October 14th and 15th, we partnered with our partners from LAFD, Los Angeles Fire Department, and we are going to do a COVID-19 rapid testing at Carview and 6 to help uh, ease patients to people because of this COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally, on October 30th, uh, through uh, my, one of my uh, stars, uh, Senior Lee Rob Solorio, he has coordinated a food giveaway uh, at uh, a fall festival at La Pita's uh, grocery store at 1401 West 3rd Street. But that is going to be a grab and go food giveaway uh, where you come in and, and just like the other events, you don't stay, you get what you need and you move on because we are still practicing social distancing, we're still wearing masks, and we're still uh, in, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, with that, I, I want to stress the importance of our programs. We have several virtual programs that are still in existence. We have our Community Police Advisory Board, and we are still taking members, our Clergy Council, our PEL organization, which is uh, uh, going to uh, give six online courses to our, 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 our youthful uh, uh, community members. Our cadet program, we're still looking for cadets. We had a virtual inspection of our 30 cadets yesterday, and we are still looking at trying to keep that program. And then I, I wanna talk about over the weekend of September 18th and 20th, you may have seen it on the East Sider Echo Park, where they show two of our officers assisting two community members climb up some stairs. Uh, these officers, did it on their own accord. They did not know that they were being videotaped, but that is the true spirit of an LAPD officer to help serve the community. And, and I wanna stress that to everybody. Uh, with that, please, uh, we are looking for people. We're looking for good men and women uh, of the department. Remember our police officers come from our community. So recruit LAPD 866-444-LAPD hotline, please. If you know a young a man or woman um, who's of age, 20 and a half or older, uh, please go on the website. We are looking to hire. We, we, need, a, we need our community members to become law enforcement officers. Uh, with that, thank you. Captain Lopez, thank you so much. And I've always thought of the definition of integrity as what someone is doing or what someone does while no one is looking. And to me, the definition of integrity is Rob Solario, who is right here, the senior lead officer. Talk about doing all sorts of good things while no one is watching. That, that is Rob Solario, whom I've worked with for years, 
My team loves Rob because of the benefit he provides um, the 13th district and all the constituents that I'm honored to serve. So Rob, what's the best way to get a hold of you if someone needs to and wants to get engaged? Yes, uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with the senior lead role in the community, the role of the senior lead officer is to be the link that helps unite the LAPD and the community that it serves. As uniformed Los Angeles police officers, we're the most visible form of city government that you'll see. We're out about in the black and white. So we are the uh, go-to for uh, resources. Uh, we can help unite you with the resources that you need to best solve your problem. To me and to every officer out there, there's no such thing as it's not a police problem. We can always be that link, if you will, that helps unite you with the source that's gonna help you solve that problem. And not only are we gonna give you that direction, we're gonna see you through the process. If you need anything from the Los Angeles Police Department, please get a hold of me at 36103 at lapd.online, or you can call me at 213-484-3056, and I will help get you connected with the resources, be it mental health, be it housing resources, be it our partners at CD13, and lastly, we are in a pandemic, we are in a heat wave, very unique times. Make sure we're checking in on our neighbors, make sure that we're supporting our local businesses. I think that's the spirit of CD13, the spirit of Echo Park, certainly. Um, and remember, we're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the Los Angeles Police Department is here to serve you. Rob, thank you so much, Captain Lopez. Thank you so much um, for being our partners in doing the best we can in our immediate community. We can't thank you enough. Uh, now we're gonna turn to Lauren Ballard of the DO Department of Tra Transportation, who's gonna give some updates on some exciting uh, traffic improvements. We've been busy across Rampart, and so Lauren is here to talk a little, little bit about some of those improvements. Lauren. That's right, thank you so much, Councilmember O'Farrell. Um, I do have a slide deck that I am hoping can be shown at this time. Um, can I get confirmation? Yes, one way or I think we're confirming. Okay, I think we're confirming that the slide deck is going to work. Fantastic. And will I see it? Um, because I do no, not now. I, I understand you're not going to see it, but uh, we're on it here in okay. the studio. Okay, great. So um, I hope that you are all seeing the Temple Street Complete Streets Project Update um, title slide. Is yes, that what you're seeing? We are. Awesome. Okay, thank you guys. Um, my name is Lauren Ballard and I am with the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. I work in our Vision Zero division and um, our mission is to end traffic fatalities in the city of Los Angeles by focusing um, strategically um, safety improvements on streets that need it the most. Um, and one of those streets um, historically has been Temple Street. Um, and so you probably have seen a lot of activity over the last couple of years um, in terms of improvements on Temple Street. So I wanted to give you sort of a brief background of the project, um, some of the project components, and then um, what's still left to come. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, okay, I'm gonna assume the slide is up um, and that you're all seeing um, the uh, 2017 and um, timeline. Is project that right? timeline, that's what's up. Amazing. Okay, <laughs> so, right. So, um, Temple Street was placed on the city's high injury network back in 2017, and it was identified for the high rate of traffic crashes that cause death or severe injury. Um, and it was placed um, on the high injury network, but it was also made actually a priority on that high injury network. Um, so really came to the front of the line in terms of um, its, its need uh, for safety improvements. In June of 2017, we partnered with some um, local organizations, including Public Matters, LA Walks, the Filipino Worker Center, and Gabba Gabba Gallery to host some um, activation events to raise awareness of traffic safety. Um, so you may um, remember uh, these, these photos may jog some memories of, of things that you may have seen out, out on the street um, in an effort to raise awareness of, of really what the traffic safety issues are on Temple. Um, so next slide, please. So then back in 2018, um, we were, Temple was not only added to as a Vision Zero priority corridor, but as a 
one of the city's first ever complete streets corridors. Um, and this was a brand new program back in 2018. Um, and it was really designed to bring together different agencies, different city departments that work on the street to um, create a sort of holistic upgrade for the street that included everything from traffic safety to um, sidewalk and street repair um, and green street elements like trees and stormwater capture. Um, and so Temple was, was identified um, and selected for this program as one of the first streets. Um, we were very fortunate um, in November of 2018 to have participated in a um, traffic safety open house hosted by Camino Nuevo and Vista Charter, um, where um, parents and students really told us um, some additional traffic safety concerns that they had um, in the sort of immediate area right around those schools. Um, and so we were able to take sort of all the, all the outreach done in 2017 and in 2018, as well as the traffic state safety, um, you know, traffic crash statistics um, and combine all of that in order to inform the Complete Streets project, which started implementation in October of 2018. Um, next slide, please. So the project took um, from about October 2018 to October 2019 to be installed. Um, and we came back as LADOT even after the project was installed to add um, some additional safety improvements in the area around the schools um, that we mentioned or that I mentioned. Um, and those are speed tables. And speed tables are um, a relatively new treatment to the city of Los Angeles. They're essentially a speed hump, um, but for a major arterial street. Um, and so they're designed to uh, slow down cars that are going a little bit faster than um, maybe you're traveling on the neighborhood streets um, where speed humps are installed. Um, and so we worked with uh, Councilmember O'Farrell's office to identify the right locations for these treatments and get them installed earlier this year. Um, next slide, please. So just running back to the Complete Streets program, just wanted to highlight um, some of the improvements that were uh, part of that project. Uh, we were able to upgrade six traffic signals with protected left turns. Um, and that's a huge safety benefit for this street. Uh, we see a lot of traffic crashes that are caused by unsafe left turns, whether that's colliding with another oncoming vehicle or um, you know, because you're looking for gaps in the vehicle traffic, you're not seeing someone crossing in the, in the crosswalk on one of the adjacent side streets. And so protected left turns have a huge safety benefit and virtually eliminate those kinds of crashes. Um, and usually we, we install them, you know, one at a time, um, kind of in a scattered approach across the city based on on need over time. Um, but we were able to focus those improvements on Temple Street to create um, really a safer, full, full um, safety upgrade for the corridor. Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. So here's just another look at those speed tables. Um, I'm sure you've you know experienced them out on the street. And if I could actually go to the next slide, um, this is a map of where the speed tables were installed. And you can see that they were strategically placed right around um, the schools and the Silver Lake Adult Daycare um, in order to slow vehicles down um, around really um, you know, sensitive populations. Um, and so we were really excited that we were able to bring um, that treatment to the street. And, Early evaluation of those um, speed tables shows that they are working. They're slowing people down um, in that area. Um, next slide, please. So finally, these are just some of the improvements that are yet to come on Temple Street. They are um, signal upgrades or new signals. Um, and these just take longer. They're expensive. They take time to design. Um, and that's why um, they are still yet to come. So those improvements include a left turn upgrade at Virgil and Silver Lake. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you all know that is a really complicated intersection and it's gonna be really great to get some additional clarity um, and, and support for people navigating that intersection in the form of that, that left turn upgrade. Um, and then two additional traffic signals are also coming to Temple one at Silver Lake Boulevard, that off-ramp, and one at Occidental. Um, we've heard from the council office and from the community that Occidental is a huge priority. Um, and so we're working to accelerate that as we can. Um, but at this time, we're looking at 2022 or 2023. 
Um, and then finally, there are two pedestrian hawk signals that we're looking at installing at Robinson and at Dawson. Um, and those are also a relatively new treatment to the city of Los Angeles. They are a more significant, stronger um, pedestrian signal um, as opposed to the more traditional flashing beacon. They actually bring cars to a stop with a red light um, and have a compliance rate of, of up to 98%. So very strong um, in protecting people as they cross the street. Um, and so that's it for me. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, this is the last slide. Um, this is our contact information. Um, email us at visionzero at lacity.org or give us a call at 213-632-9564. And you can also just follow along with the project at the project page, ladotlivablestreets.org slash project slash temple. Um, and we also have a feedback form there. So if you wanna let us know how, how it's going, um, any additional concerns you have, you can also um, input feedback there. Thank you. Lauren, thank you, and all of your slides were up, so uh, it, it worked just right. It was synced up with everything you were saying, so. Uh, awesome. Thanks for thank your... you so much for having us. Oh, are you kidding? Thank you for your work on this, Lauren. Uh, the communities love the improvements along Temple and Beverly, and the fact that DOT is tackling that extremely complicated intersection uh, with Silver Lake and, and Temple and Beverly, that entire um, complicated intersection, you're really approaching this uh, with problem solving in mind and you're making a huge difference. Thank you. All right, our last panelist. Uh, we are very excited that we have um, a new 100% uh, affordable project opening up soon in the area. And so I'd like to uh, welcome Sam Borelli who uh, represents one of my favorite nonprofits, Holly West Hollywood Community Housing Corporation that we work with and partner with and they have projects across the city. Uh, and so without further ado, Sam Borelli to talk about The Mint. <laughs> Thank you, council member. Good morning. Good morning, CD13 and the Rampart Village community. Uh, my name is Sam Borelli and I'm the director of external affairs for West Hollywood Community Housing Corporation. I'm really excited to be here to give you a quick snapshot of WHCHC's soon to be open affordable apartment community Rampart Mint, or as the council members now calling it, The Mint. I like it. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, really quick, just a little bit about us, and I too have a slideshow, so I'm hoping everything stinks up. I'm often technologically challenged. So, so far, so good. It all works. <laughs> Excellent. So first slide, just a little bit about WHCHC. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is building homes and providing services that move community members from insecurity to stability. We've been creating high quality, affordable housing for 34 years. We began in West Hollywood and have since expanded throughout LA County. Today, we house over 900 residents and 574 units at 17 buildings, soon to be 18, in three cities. Our buildings are not your typical affordable housing projects. They are, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Our award-winning approach design means that our apartment communities are both functional and beautiful. We like to say we build our buildings for our residents and our neighbors. Our properties fit seamlessly into their neighborhoods. Our values of integrity res and quality resonate through everything that we do, the affordable housing that we build and the critical support services that we provide. And now, drum roll please, you and your mm -hmm. constituents are about to get a first sneak peek. Wish I were there live, but the construction still continues, so I didn't want to get in their way. <laughs> Rampart Mint is 22 units of permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless and chronically homeless individuals with special needs. There's also an additional unit for an on-site building manager. Rampart Mint is getting its finishing touches as we speak, and we'll be welcoming residents just in a matter of weeks. Literally this month, now that we're in October, residents will start to move in. Co-developed with affordable living for the aging, Rampart Mint is built on formerly city-owned land and designated specifically for affordable housing only. ALA will provide the on-site building management and has decades of experience working with special needs populations. WHCHC is known for its amenity-enriched environments and Rampart Mint is no exception. The beautiful building includes a community room with kitchen and computer area, and an office for the on-site building manager and two social services offices. 
The kitchen seen here is used for helping cooking demonstrations and resident gatherings once we were able to do that safely, of course. The rooftop deck and garden has spectacular views of the city. And you'll see, hopefully, I'm not seeing it, but hopefully you're seeing the kitchen. You'll see the de universal design principles. Each unit is designed to accommodate those with or without physical limitations. It looks so beautiful, residents Sam. We can see it. Excellent. Thank you. So folks can truly age in place and not be displaced, which is one of the reasons why people end up uh, on the streets eventually. Um, a wheelchair can roll right up to the sink and all of the shelves are adjustable for height. But housing alone is not enough. Our buildings house people, our support services keep them housed. Along with our social service provider partners such as Heritage Clinic, our staff of professional resident services coordinators facilitate the mental, emotional and physical well-being of our residents through one-on-one -on -one assessments, individualized service plans, and linkages to resources such as physical and mental health care, transportation, food, and other benefits. In addition, we offer lifelong learning workshops, cultural enrichment programs, and community building events. Hopefully you can see Mariana from our Movie Town Square apartment community after a healthy food and cooking demonstration at that kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then residents at Blue Hibiscus uh, here in West Hollywood were making healthy soup with fresh produce delivered by our partners at Seeds of Hope. Food insecurity is something that's affecting people all across the world. And our resident services coordinators help to combat that among our residents. And we've had a number of service providers help, especially during this pandemic deliver safely to our residents. These life enhancing services support independent living and successful aging in place. Our services are voluntary, offered on site and free of charge. Council member, we are so excited to welcome these 22 individuals to their homes. We are so grateful to have had your and your team support, strong support in this process and thrilled to be able to give you this sneak peek of Rampart Mint, and I will turn it back to you. Sam, thank you so much. Uh, this is, uh, has been a wonderful experience, and it's beautiful. And what a view. I mean, <laughs> this is really, really terrific. And it's interesting because even with Path Metro Villas and the Link Housing and some of our other projects, and we have uh, over 2,000 units of affordable or permanent supportive housing uh, since I've been in office to come online, some people misunderstand and we get calls about why am I only building luxury housing? But what a lot of folks don't realize is that it's, it's oftentimes either 100% affordable or permanent supportive housing. So it's a mix uh, and this is the way to do it. Build quality homes for people who need it. And so we thank the West Hollywood uh, Housing Corporation for your incredible work. Um, thank you panelists uh, for participating today. We're going to take a few questions. I think we have a few minutes for some questions. And again, what we don't answer right now, we'll answer um, online uh, for sure. So with that. Council member, we have a question from Robina. Uh, the question is, given the still very dire con uh, circumstances of tenants, other residents, and unemployed community members, as well as, stay at, as, well as the stay-at-home mandate, uh, can you push to postpone parking enforcement? that is to be resumed on October 15th. Robina, thank you for the question. Uh, it's an important question. So when the pandemic struck, uh, the city council and the mayor uh, felt it was important to do relaxed parking since we were pushing people, uh, requiring people to, to, to shelter at home, <clears throat> especially uh, in the early days. Uh, and we've since continued that. I led continuing that uh, last month, early last month, so that we would give people more time. There's been an adjustment period. Well, yesterday the city council did vote to uh, usher in parking enforcement uh, requirements to, uh, again, to enforce. Um, but what I insisted upon is that we give a grace period. So even though parking enforcement begins um, in the immediate, there will be no fines imposed. So. If you go out to your car in the next couple of weeks, you'll see a warning sign if you have some sort of violation of parking and you won't get ticketed with a fine or towed. So those, the enforcement officially begins on October 15th. 
giving people a, a little more time to adjust. We realize times are difficult. You're schooling your kids at home. Um, so please think of ways that you can accommodate the parking restrictions that exist uh, within your neighborhood where you live. Thank you for the question. All right, council member, the next question is from Paula. Where can I make an inquiry about illegal dumping near the 101 at Coronado? There's furniture, refrigerators, and other bulky items. It's ongoing. Paula, thank you for the question. So my clean team goes out, like I said, five days a week to do large and small projects, including taking care of bulky items. Uh, so please contact Sylvan de la Cruz at my office, 213-207-3015. Uh, 213-207-3015. Uh, and we will take care of this. Now, if it's on a Caltrans right of way, and oftentimes along the 101 corridor, they are, then we have to work with Caltrans, and they're not always um, as responsive as quickly as we would like them to be. But let us know where it is and we'll deal with it. Council member, the next question is, what is being done to offer cooling centers closer to the district? So we have cooling center information on my Instagram page, and we will put that also on the feed right now, so you'll know where the nearest cooling center is. Um, unfortunately, we still have a lot of closures with libraries, et cetera. I, fully agree that we need more cooling, cooling centers. However, they have been underutilized, so we need to do a better job at getting the word out on where they exist right now. So be looking for that in the feed. All right, Council Member, and the last question, what are some of the challenges servicing and cleaning around encampments during COVID-19? Okay, so the challenges of cleaning around existing encampments during COVID-19. Well, first of all, all CDC guidelines are being followed. So if someone who's experiencing homelessness uh, lets us know that they are self-isolating, they will not be disturbed. But it's important that we also keep the areas clean because uh, at some of these uh, encampments, we also find um, really unsafe uh, conditions. We find discarded needles, dead rats. Uh, there's MRSA, there's all sorts of diseases, typhus, that can come into play if we don't keep our surfaces clean. So while we do engage in the cleanups, we also offer services for people experiencing homelessness with our outreach teams at the same time. Uh, and again, following all safety guidelines and striking the right balance to keeping our neighborhoods clean, but also making sure that we can offer a path to wellness for people who are experiencing homelessness as well. And with that, I think that's all the time for questions right now, but we'll get to them uh, in the rest of the feed. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the team here at Channel 35 for always hosting us and doing such a wonderful job. Uh, we applaud you. We're grateful. And again, thanks to my team and thanks to the panelists today. Uh, upward and onward for Rampart Village. Have a wonderful and safe autumn. Thank you.